you can now hear Movie Heaven, Movie Hell on Stitcher. Stitcher is radio on demand. Listen anytime, anywhere. Stitcher is an award-winning free app that lets you listen to all your favorite shows, plus discover from 20,000 news, entertainment, and sports shows. You can also create your own custom playlists. Stitcher is available on iOS, Android, Nook, iPad, and in over 4 million car dashboards. It's on demand and it's on the go. No downloading, no syncing, no wasted memory. You can stream your favorite podcasts from Stitcher. Don't have Stitcher? Download it free today at stitcher.com or in the App Store. And please leave us a review and rating on Stitcher. Thank you. Welcome to Movie Heaven, Movie Hell with me, Simon Aiken, and... And I'm Keith Isles, and we are both independent filmmakers that enjoy talking about and critiquing other directors' work. But um, this Indeed. is a special edition, and uh, first I want to say, Happy New Year, everyone! Yes, Happy New Year. Happy uh, New this Year, is... Simon. <laughs> Happy New Year, Keith. Well, it is our New Year special. And we thought we'd do something special for uh, the listeners out there. And so uh, back in November, we asked you, the listeners, to uh, give us uh, picks of films that uh, we didn't cover um, over the last um, load of episodes we've done from all the directors we we looked at. And we got a long list and we've picked four. And... Uh, Two are our movie heavens and two are movie hells. So as we go along, we will say the name of the we'll you know say the title of the film and who the winner is, and then we'll talk about the film. <laughs> Yay! In our usual fashion, absolutely. <laughs> yes, otherwise it would be a very short, uh, very short podcast. <laughs> absolutely, it would, and we don't want a short podcast, do we? I mean, heaven forbid. No. Heaven forbid, they no. have to be feature length. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you've recovered from our Christmas special. Indeed, and hopefully everybody had a great Christmas and Santa bought them everything they wanted. And if mm. not, you might end up with something you either want or don't want from this podcast. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> right, well, let's get into it. So, uh, Keith... Uh, what was your pick for Movie Heaven? Right. Well, I have to say, first of all, um, obviously, you know, the list of directors we'd done up to that point was uh, was quite an inspired list indeed. And, and you know, lots of films those directors did that, that, that I've always liked. And uh, the list that came through, I didn't look at any names. I just literally looked at the films. So I wasn't in any way swayed. And it was... I have to say, really hard to choose because there were some fantastic movies in there that I'd love to talk about. So it was really hard to narrow it down to, to one for movie heaven, certainly. Um, but uh, I ended up choosing uh, one of my all time favorites that uh, that I like to talk about. Um, Escape from New York by John Carpenter, which he directed in 1981. And I believe that was sent by a listener called Alan. Um, don't have any other information apart from his Twitter tag is Halloween Fury. So uh, don't know you, Alan, but um, good choice. Uh, thank you for choosing and allowing me to have a chat now with Simon about Escape from New York. Yes, uh, Escape from New York, um, uh, fa a favorite of mine as well. Um, it was when we were going through the John Carpenter picks, it was a, it was a close second. It was either I was going to talk about this one or I was going to talk about Big Trouble in Little China. And Big Trouble just just for me, I wanted to talk about it a bit more than Escape from New York. But it's it's a great film. Um, I mean, it's amazing f for what they do with the very small budget they have because they make you believe that uh, New York 
is a a maximum uh, <laughs> prison, you know. Exactly, exactly. Now, I mean, this is this is this is in a well a long list of of, of one of my favourite films. Sort of growing up, um, it's certainly one that I've owned multiple times in every format you can imagine. So I remember I uh, it was one of the the first few that I bought uh, when when it came out. I got it with some pocket money that I saved up, and uh, you know that was that was in my collection, and then. Before I actually moved to America, and one of the times that I went out there prior to moving out there, um, I actually bought, they, they released it as a, still a video cassette, VHS, but it was a, a widescreen edition. And it also had the deleted scene, the deleted heist scene, uh, you, you know, included sort of for the first time that you could get anything special like that. So I, I bought it like that. Then you know, in the early noughties, I got it the DVD special edition. And uh, I've since actually bought it twice on Blu-ray. I bought it when it first came out. But then because last year um, I invested in a multi-region Blu-ray player that would allow me to play region A. Um, when I was at Fright Fest this year, uh, there was a Shout Factory uh, special edition, um, which had a new transfer of the film plus a load of new exclusive special features so um i decided to treat myself to that and i have to say this podcast was then my excuse to actually uh, get that out of the cellophane and watch it so um <laughs> so yes it's been a fun ride <laughs> can i ask is it a, is it a good blu-ray it is yes um uh th there's a lot of debate actually online as to whether this transfer is better or worse than the um initial blu-ray release and it's simply it's not to do with anything to do with picture quality it's more to do with uh color palette and grade okay it's it's a slightly darker um transfer um so there's a lot of debate i haven't quite made up my mind which i think is better yet um in terms of the extras though as always and you know i like to be a completist <laughs> there is one extra there's loads of new extras on this there's a new commentary by um director dean cundy and uh adrian barbo don't you mean director of photography is that what i said what did i you say? said you said director oh no director of photography sorry yes um <laughs> there, there is of course one by director john carpenter and kurt russell which is ported across <laughs> From the previous, um, you, sh you sh sure you've seen the right version? You sure it's not Dun Dean Cundy's Escape from New York? That <laughs> wow, you saw? yeah, that that would be very different, wouldn't it? You know, <laughs> so hey, we like Dean, but uh, no, but yeah. no, this is definitely John Carpenter's, and there's also a commentary by Deborah Hill, uh, the now late Deborah Hill, sadly, uh, that she did back in um, in the late nineties, I think. Uh, and then there's a shitload of extra features, but there was one on the original release, uh, a John Carpenter interview that isn't present on this version. So again, oh, it's, yeah. you know, this this BR DVD minefield that I'm always talking about. Well, there you go. If you want to have everything, you've got to have both versions. So ah. craziness, craziness. It is, it is. But it's, it's a, a tactic that makes people keep on buying exactly and, and yeah suckers and mugs just like me keep on buying but it is with a it is with a select few films well quite a lot of films but <laughs> <laughs> but this is one of them so uh yeah so when was the first time you watched this my god i think the first time i watched this and it was one of those lovely situations where i was allowed to stay up late and all that stuff or at least late for the age i was um it was it was on television uh, it was on it was a BBC like a BBC two screening. So it was completely uh, un, uninterrupted with with our ad breaks and things of that nature. And, um, you, you know, obviously it was the future then. I mean, I mean, one of the, one of the things that, that, that this film hasn't kind of uh, uh, aged well with is the fact that, uh, you, you know, apparently and this was made in 1981 and apparently in 1988, there was a 400 increase in crime in, in the States. And obviously this film takes place in 1997, uh, which was obviously the future uh, at that point. Um, and yeah, you know, obviously uh, it's, it's then this maximum security, uh, prison what always makes me laugh is these films that were made like in the 60s and 70s and 80s and they they saw the future being so fantastical 
that if I if they were to jump into a time machine from then and c- arrive now and see what actually it was like, they probably think it's really boring. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. I mean, um, you, you, you know, it was in, interesting uh, the sort of dystopian take this this has on 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 the future or, or the then future. Um, but uh, no, I I just remember thinking it was really cool. Um, I thought Snake Plissken, played by Kurt Russell, was was you know the man. I thought he was a really cool character. And what I liked about all of this was, it, you know, it was it was kind of the little details that really got me, even as a kid. I mean, there's that scene just before he goes on the mission where he has all of the kit laid out on the table, you know, yeah. guns yeah. and throwing stars and radios and wrist receivers and all all of these cool gadgets and i I remember thinking that this was just absolutely awesome (laughs) so um so yeah it's always been it's always been sort of up there in um in one of my uh you know favorite favorites of john carpenter uh from the time but uh yes yeah so but it is it is interesting with sci-fi and particularly anything that deals with the future obviously if you're not jumping hundreds of years into the future, then, then, you know, you always do kind of have this, um, uh, you you know, problem where the films don't age in terms of, you you know, they don't necessarily match up with what happens in the, uh, in the film timeline. But uh... (laughs) But I like to think of them as uh, like, slices of alternative universes indeed we like we like the uh, alternative universe is is so widely accepted now yes we we love that this is a a parallel reality (laughs) exactly the thing about this film that makes it so great is because it's it's like a western oh totally and and a lot of uh john carpenter's earlier work were very much based on westerns like um assault on precinct 13 Mm -hmm. there's a lot of tropes in there that was you know that he got from uh like john ford westerns and stuff like that uh you know the one man who has to go in and uh rescue in this case the president of the united states the president of what (laughs) (laughs) you're the duke (laughs) the duke of new york a number one (laughs) a number one Oh dear! Oh, it's very uh, quotable film, isn't it? It is very quotable. <laughs> I have to laugh though because there's a bit at the end when uh, he has the um, machine gun and he sh- he's shooting the Duke. And I never quite understand what he says. Wow! He's, yeah, he, he's doing the whole "Hey you, Duke, Hey Number One," isn't he? Kind well, of he thing, is, but, but he goes, like, yeah. "Idiot!" This is this is the line that always goes, "Idiot!" I'm like, "What?" Yeah. No. What? Uh, let, let's just say Donald Pleasant's a wonderful character actor, absolutely wonderful. <laughs> mm. Love him the bits, miss him greatly, but yeah. but he did sometimes make some interesting acting choices, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that was one of them. But uh, <laughs> but I kind of yeah. but I kind of like it. I mean, obviously he's a, he, he's a, you know he was a frequent John Carpenter collab collaborator anyway. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, it was interesting to see him playing the. Uh, the, the president in this um and uh you, you know the, the 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 reason for the mission if you like because he was on his way to this special summit uh with a recording you know that was supposed to uh save the future of mankind and all this sort of thing and of course you know the plane gets hijacked and it ends up crashing uh within the maximum security of um manhattan island and Snake, who who in the, that deleted scene that I mentioned uh, had been caught uh, and was was about to be sentenced, etc. When you know they look at his record and realise that he might be the sort of guy that they could uh, send in on this sort of supposedly <laughs> it almost seems like a one way rescue mission. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the, the the lovely thing about this film is there's always a ticking clock. Mm. I mean. Um, literally has got Bliskin's got a, a life clock on his um, wrist which lets him know how long he's got to rescue the president and get out of there because when it runs out not only is the president's usefulness run out but also uh, Snake Pliskin's life will run out yeah. because they've implanted these two uh, pills in his neck they're like um, 
they're tiny explosives the sign of a size of a pinhead they're dissolving but, uh, yeah they're dissolving and once they they finish dissolving they explode and take out his major artery yeah. no yeah. more no more summit and no more snake biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, you're right. That that is one of the one of the things that makes this so good. Is is you you literally? I mean, he has the stakes are very high for him. Um, yeah. you, you know, to complete this mission and be successful. Um, and he has he has you know less than 24 hours. It's about 22 hours he has by the time he sets off on the mission. Um, you know, to not only locate the president, but uh, you know, to get him out of whatever, whatever dangerous situation he happens to be in and get him across, you, you know, through this this crazy every man for himself, you know, you know prison <laughs> island, effectively, and, uh, and and get him back in time. So, so yeah, straight away, you've got really good storytelling device here in the fact that, um, you, you know, the stakes are very high. And uh, Carpenter wrote this, you know, in conjunction with Nick Castle, who worked on... Um, Halloween uh, with him portraying Michael Myers. Um, yes, and also the director of one of my favourite films, The Last Starfighter. Oh my God, yes, The Last Starfighter. How can we forget <laughs> that film? Awesome. Uh, but yes, and, and, and then obviously produced uh, with, by Deborah Hill and Larry J. Franco, who, who he, he, he frequently collaborated with. Um, it even starts actually with an uncredited voiceover by Jamie Lee Curtis, who's doing oh, the... Uh, yes. The information about what happened, you know, to, to, to get to where we are now, i.e. between 81 and 97, sort of what happened in the US and uh, and why, you know, Manhattan Island was turned into this um, maximum security prison. So, uh, um, yeah, it's, 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 it really is, uh, you know, straight away that the film wastes no time in, in setting up its premise and... Um, uh, you, you know, setting the stakes and, and, and getting you on side with this character, because this is apparently, um, you know, read it, reading a bit of information, listen to some interviews and whatever. Um, you know, the backers of the film didn't necessarily want Kurt Russell because of his kind of Disney boy image that he'd had up until this point. And, uh, you know, names such as Clint Eastwood were being sort of batted around as, as a possible Snake Pliskin. Saying that, if they could have got um, Clint Eastwood in there, we would have had a uh, for a few dollars more reunion with him and Lee Van Cleef. Lee Van Cleef, absolutely, absolutely. You'd have had, you'd have got, you know, nods, even more nods to the spaghetti westerns, which would have been, um, which mm. would have been cool. But, but you know, we 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 like Kurt in this. He does a uh, he does a fantastic job. He looks awesome. I mean, it, apparently it was his idea to include the eye patch, um, which in you know defines the character quite nicely and um what i always thought was marvelous was was the fact that obviously which i'm sure we'll talk about briefly at some point but some 15 years later that they, they end ah, up making yes. the sequel escape from la yes, we will we will talk about that yes and kurt, kurt russell looked as you know he had the same costume and he looked as good you know 15 years on as he did in this film so um you know, hats off to any any guys that can that can pull that off, and and, and Kurt certainly did. So, <laughs> so good well, stuff, you know. Well, this is the thing. I didn't see this film until uh, nineteen ninety. Uh, my dad rented it from the um, video shop, but I was very familiar with the poster. I mean, the poster of the uh, Statue of Liberty lying on its side, with you know gangs of people in the background and a snake running with the president and firing his machine gun. And then you had, uh, I think also Adrienne Barboa is on there as well, looking very sexy in her, her red dress. Her very low cut red dress. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, but... He was obviously Mrs. Carpenter at that point. And um, yes, uh, you, you know, um, yeah, yeah. Very, 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 very pleasing also. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, the fact that, um, uh, Kurt Russell's then girlfriend at the time, Susan Hubley, was in the film. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Not not a, not a massive uh, part, but still in it nonetheless. <laughs> but uh, I I do remember off. I I remember love loved watching that film the first time. I really it really stuck with me. I remember I did like an essay for English 
where I st- I said it in the future and I said that um, the opening lines was that um, uh, there was a Robocop in every street and New York had been turned into a prison, which my uh, English teacher wrote, um, yes, this is fine, but uh, really you should come up with your own ideas. Aye. And then he's and then he came up to me afterwards. He said, "Oh, uh, I've never seen the film, but I, I really liked the book." <laughs> oh, okay, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> which is um, which is great because um, that was back in the day when they would do book adaptations of films. Right. Yes. And uh, Alan Dean Foster was like the the go to guy I remember for doing all these. Wasn't he just? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So he he did, he did a novelization of this, did he? I don't. Uh, I'm not sure if it was him. Right. I'm. I'm. You know, I I've not seen a novelization of this. I've seen that that there was a board game. Right. From Parker, but uh, I've never. Um, well, I'm sure there is because that was the thing to do at that time. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but... I mean, Alan Dean Foster springs to mind because he he did adaptations of quite famous films like Alien, and, Alien, uh, Star Wars, Star Wars, yeah. Star Trek. Mm. Well, well, George Lucas actually wrote um, the f- for for Star Wars. I think it was Empire Strikes Back that Alan Dean Foster did. Yeah, and what well, what he did is he did a he, he actually kind of ghost wrote for George Lucas on that. Oh, and right. then what they did is they had a deal for him to do a, a spin-off book called Splinter of the Mind's, the Mind's Eye, Eye, which yes. was kind of the first oh, yes. foray into the expanded universe as they yes. as they called it. But um yeah, but no I mean you, you know you know escape escape from New York um you, you know considering it was made on a you know, a rather modest budget. I mean, it was about six million dollars, uh, which obviously, you know, sounds like a lot, but it, that that really isn't. Um, and uh, you, you know, it, it it looked great. I mean, w- what I thought was very creative. They used a lot of um, uh, Roger Corman's guys for special effects. One of which was actually James Cameron. Um, yes. Do you, you know, know what he did on the film? Well, he. D- I know that. He did some of the, uh, the, the the bit where the, the you see the jets, uh, the, the Air Force One, sorry, at the beginning uh, against the clouds and whatever. I know that was a um, composite model shot that he worked on. But also right. uh, at well, the time, the wire graphics that they had on the displays, uh, that actually was, was quite difficult to achieve back then. So rather than actually having them achieve with computers at the time, they actually built models and put the reflective um, edging tape on there to sort of create those uh, what were then seen as high tech <laughs> computer wire models and stuff. And right. I know he was involved uh, in some of that as well. Yeah, he? James Cameron, he does get a lot of, um, uh, what's the word? Kudos? Um, yes, for, for stuff that he didn't do. He did the matte paintings. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he did the map paintings, especially of like New York and stuff. It, I, I've seen stuff where uh, they say, "Oh, James Cameron did all the special effects on um, Bat Beyond the Stars," when really he did. He was the art director. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I know he came. I know he came up with designs for the uh, the vehicles and stuff, but um, it's um, I, I've. I, I, from reading a book about him, it was very much that um, there was other people involved in that. The same people that he brought on to do the Terminator. Well, I thought the effects worked quite nicely in this. I mean, oh, the was, effects was... are brilliant in it. I yeah, mean, I mean, they 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 just so, they work really well. I mean, and they just they put you in there straight away because it's they use rear projection with people on the wall. And you know a lot of camera trickery. I mean, I love the shot where the heli um, at the beginning a helicopter's taken out two escapees on the water, and it f- comes back to the Statue of Liberty. And so they shot the helicopter coming in, and then at the Statue of Liberty they had part of the set, and then they panned across, and they, there's a, like a, a secret cut, and then as it moves, it moves onto their other set. That's right, like a dam. That's and right. making it look like this whole um, military base is huge. Yeah. Oh no. I mean, there was yeah, there was some really good uh, 
you know, obviously use of camera with 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 Dean Cundy, but mixing that with with uh, the effects guys and um, you, you know back projections and um, you you know model composites and and yeah, things of that nature. Yeah, like matte that, yeah. paintings, which yeah. made made it look absolutely fantastic. And uh, in fact, something I learnt uh, recently. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as as we're recording this, we're obviously right in the midst of absolute star wars mania now which will be another <laughs> podcast definitely at some point but apparently yes. um jj abrahams who, who who was a, a teenager at the time but his dad was involved in in the production of escape from new york again family in the business what can we say but yep. um but he apparently suggested to john carpenter about the showing Adrian Barbeau's character being dead at the after you know the car had rammed and John oh, wow. Carpenter ended up shooting that some months after the production outside of his own garage um <laughs> at his home uh you know to put that in but it's, it's interesting names like that crop up you know because yeah. JJ is certainly man of the moment and deservedly so in my book you know um yeah. I've loved him you know right from alias days but um uh but but you, you know um interesting that, that, that some of these names sort of come out wood of the woodwork on these on these films that we think of as is sort of classic films now but they were they were there, you know. <laughs> well, so. I mean, if you've lived, if you live in Hollywood, then it's you know, and you have family that work in the business, then it, it bound, it's bound to happen. Yeah, no, absolutely, it's bound to happen, absolutely. Yeah. If you can catch the bug at an early age, it's great because then you, it's better to get in there earlier than later. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, um, one of the things you know, as as this is a New Year's podcast, to just sort of mm -hmm. reminisce a little bit on 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 this past year um, with something that that you know obviously ties into Escape from New York here um, is uh, you know I'm pleased to say that this year um, you know creatively um, etc has, has been a, a you know quite a good year I've worked on uh, you know I've got back to sort of create my own work and, and doing more stuff but also yeah. um I've been very lucky this year I've I've, I've got to uh, to travel a little more which is obviously next to films you know that that's my other big love in life and uh, mm -hmm. haven't done nearly as much of that as I'd like to but you know I, I've, I've done a few things but in terms of experiences this year um I was I was fortunate enough. I didn't I didn't actually go to the Escape from New York one, unfortunately. But uh, for Halloween this year, Alan Howarth was uh, at the Union Chapel. Uh, oh right! And I saw the he did a um, sort of Halloween two through six uh, concert, if you like, where he he'd play um, during scenes from Halloween, from those Halloween films, but oh, okay. the, the night before, and I wasn't able to go to it, sadly, he, they actually had escape from New York playing, but with him actually doing the music live, which would have been awesome to have seen, you know, um, he did, he did a little bit. He did the main theme, um, on the night that I was there, but, uh, but yeah, it would have been quite cool to have seen the film. And then of course, you you know we've done fright fest and we've we we've, we've you know done a few events and whatever but of course you and I have been lucky enough as well this year to actually uh, see Kurt Russell in a Q and A haven't we Yes we did as you probably know because <laughs> we did a podcast of that but yes we went to see uh, the Hateful Eight which uh, has um, um, a few homages to the thing Oh definitely yeah it actually uses a track from the soundtrack in the film. Tarantino uh, uncharacteristically with a uh, a composer on board in the form of, of Morricone, but uh, rather than just sort of using existing um, tracks and whatever, he was the, there was actually stuff composed specifically for this film, which is uh, unusual. But um, yeah, but no, no yeah, I but mean, I think we've covered all exactly. That. But my point, yeah. my point being, uh, this year's been you know actually a, a pretty good year for. Uh, for doing stuff and um yeah that that whole alan howarth um you, you, you know uh concert if you like um obviously tied into this and i would have yeah i would have liked to have seen the uh, escape from new york one but uh never mind it was good it was good what i did see <laughs> um so yeah i mean th you know th this film um y y you know i i think w was ahead of its time in terms of uh 
you know, create in this world, regardless of whether things actually turned out that way or not. Um, it really works. Uh, it's really fun to watch still. Um, I must admit, watching it this time, um, you, you know, made me realize, you know, how much I enjoy it and why, you know, it, it, it absolutely um, made concrete the reason for me choo choosing it to, to talk about tonight. Um, and uh, oh, I've just by the way, I've just looked up while while we were talking there. Yes, there was in 1981, Bantam Books did publish a movie tie in novelization by an author called Mike McQuay. So okay. there you go. So there was there one. Go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, you know, uh, re really, really uh, works on a lot of levels, um, which I have to say, you know, when they years later when they finally announced that they were going to do a sequel for, for this let me just stop you there before we get on to the sequel because i want to talk about one bit of editing in the film that always drives me a little bit nuts okay and i i it, it doesn't i don't know why they did it this way so it's about an hour into the film and uh snake plissken has been captured by the duke and his gang yeah and you you start seeing all this like uh, you know the sun's starting to come up um people are, are worried because they've lost contact with him and you know there's the whole bit with and then you see snake wake up and then it cuts to another sh um, you know more more things happening and then it cuts to him rolling it sort of kind of getting up and a guy sort of standing there with a poncho walks away and then some more stuff happens and it cuts back to Snake. And you see the guy in the poncho down the end of the hall. Right. Now, the, why it drives me nuts is because um, the day is progressing, but each time we cut back to uh, Snake Pliskin, it's the same scene. Right, right. So but, uh, what makes it a, a slightly annoying is the fact that it makes it look like that guy in the poncho's taken hours to walk down this hallway. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? It takes away from the ticking clock aspect a little bit, yeah? Because it's distracting. Well, it, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. And, you know, it would have been nice to hold that back because, you know, they, they are worried about Snake Plissken. Is he alive? Is he dead? You know, what's going to happen to him? And we, you know, I... I I know they made the decision. Well, we'll show that he's all right, but they could have they could have just kept that as one scene instead of splitting it up into different things. And I've never really seen or heard anything about reasoning why that happened, mm -hmm. or in any um, director's commentary. There's it's never sort of talked about, and it's one of those things. It's it slightly drives me nuts every time I see it. I mean, um, the, uh, the first time it really jumped out at me was when I went to the John Carpenter all night to see Escape from New York. Mm -hmm. And, you know, <laughs> you couldn't quite miss that on the big screen. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's the it's the, it's the one thing that slightly errs me when I'm watching it. I mean, it's not enough to diminish my enjoyment of the film, but it's always that thing that's like, why did they do that? It, it makes any sense. Yeah. So it's the sort of thing that if you were lucky enough to... Um to meet john carpenter to speak to uh it's a sort of question you'd ask him yeah <laughs> well it wouldn't be my first question because i don't think it'd be a very long conversation but um i would um yeah if i had the chance to sit down and talk to him uh i would bring it up maybe the last thing because because <laughs> i know at the end of the day um sometimes you make editing decisions like that because you don't have a like, choice sometimes a choice yeah. yeah 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 or it was just uh you know a creative choice at the time and for every, i don't think anybody else really talks about it either i've not never heard anybody bring that up before so mm. yeah yeah i have to it admit it's me. obviously something that hasn't bugged me too much and it's funny because a lot of things do bug me in films as you well know but <laughs> um yeah interesting, interesting. well yes continuity in films. <laughs> yeah yeah which uh funnily enough they did a pretty good job of when they came back to do escape from la they they did yeah i mean it was yeah. let's be honest it was a it was a disappointing film in some ways yes. wasn't it 
Um, yeah, well, it was a remake of Escape from New York, but it was just set in LA. Yeah, yeah, and it was supposed to be a sequel, but it, yeah, it was kind of. I mean, I agree. I, I liked the whole, um, and I think you mentioned this when you spoke when you did your podcast with with Mike. Um, yeah, that time is, and I totally agree with you. I like the, I like the sort of dark literally dark ending where he uh, where he sends <laughs> yes. everything back into the dark ages you know by by you know pulling the plug as it were and um i thought uh, i thought that was that was quite a interesting and and and, and brave note uh y- you know to end on um and it, you know it had his good moments i mean kurt was awesome in it and whatever but it, it just you know even though it had a higher budget and whatever it just didn't quite have the uh the, the the charm of or the grit of this film did it really? no and it was just um you know the situations he got into were just ridiculous i mean the <laughs> whole basketball game yes yeah yeah and then the surfboarding nonsense the surfboarding, as well yeah. yeah 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 i mean you know it was kind of it was a disappointing yeah. sequel yeah. Um, yeah. and, and it, unnecessary in many respects beat by beat it was you know just um a remake of the first one yeah yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, the opening I I quite liked as well. I, I quite liked the opening and stuff where, you know, you you see what kind of state the US is in, and you know the whole, you know. I remember the trailer where you, you, it started off like an information video for the cinema, and it's like there's no smoking, no uh, <laughs> no rich meat, no red wine, no swearing, and then it cuts into the into the into the trailer into the story yeah and uh, i kind of i kind of like that they sort of pushed that world a bit more because in the first one it was just a military state yes but in this new one it was much more controlling i mean the bit where there he's walking to the departation area or debark uh, yeah god it's a, it's a, it's a tongue twister but when he's going through you know the entry point into la and you actually see people taking the suicide option because in the first one you hear it. Yes, that's true. The tannoy along. says it, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but did you did you know who the tannoy was in the first one? It was Jamie Lee, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but she she only does that one, and then they use another voice for the other tannoy, which is a bit bit strange. Oh, right. Okay. Well, maybe it was mm. something they came up with later in in post and possibly, you know, yeah, yeah, possibly. Maybe. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was a you know it was a disappointing sequel. It had it had its good yeah. moments, but um, yeah, it didn't it didn't sort of live up to uh, to the charm of this one. And uh, yeah, you know this this is this is one of those movies that I think is very very easy to sit through. Um, and yeah, it's it's definitely got something. I think even by even by today's standards. Um, there's still something enjoyable about this, you know, like you said, sort of pseudo Western uh, dystopian future. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's, it's an interesting, I like, I like what you said about the uh, alternate reality. It's uh, yeah. it, it's an interesting yeah. alternate reality that could well have been, you know, <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Right. Let's move on. Yes. Um, right. My pick for movie heaven is um, Carrie. Yay, which we like. And this was this this was picked by uh, Stuart Wright. Oh, okay, good old Stuart. Yeah, yeah. So um, this uh, being from Brian De Palma, this was his first um, studio f- film, and I remember seeing Scene by Scene with Mark Cousins, and he asked him why he chose to make this film, and he said, "I needed a job." Right. Yeah. And I mean, also, we've <laughs> talked a lot about Stephen King and this was actually the first uh, Stephen King adaptation, wasn't it? And it was because it was the first Stephen King book. Steve, absolutely. Um, Carrie was the one that, you know, launched him. And I think also brought Brian De Palma to sort of, you know, international market. I mean, he'd been making films as an independent for quite a while up to this point, but um it's a, it's really well done. It's one of these films where he he uses a lot of his techniques we talked about in on the podcast for those other films, so split screen voyeurism. Um, but it's also very, um, 
I'm going to use the word respectful. It's probably not the right word, but it's very respectful of of the main character played by Sissy Spacek. You know, even that's that opening scene with her in the shower, uh-huh. uh, the music going and everything like that. And yes, yeah, she's she's naked and stuff, but you never really see anything. It's not titillating, you know. And then when you see the blood, I mean, you really your heart goes out to this poor girl, especially what the other girls do to her. Absolutely, yeah, no, I agree. It's done very well, actually. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those films that I think in the wrong hands, it would have been a melodrama. It has melodrama elements to it. I mean, the music in some places has that sort of melodrama feel. I mean, especially when she's, you know, at the, um, oh, the, grad. it's not graduation ball, is it? Uh, yeah, it is, isn't it? It's like the oh, it's homecoming, the prom. It's the, the prom. prom thing, it's yeah. the prom, the prom. Yeah, so that kind of music they have playing over the when they're at the prom and she's been, you know, they've they've been voted king and queen before the buckets of pig blood. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, uh, but then when when things like that happens with the whole telekinesis, you get the whole sort of psycho strings, you know. Ee, ee, ee. Well, not so many, but it's ee, ee. yeah, no, definitely. Every time she uses her power, and. Um, yeah, it was, um, it, it's, a, it's a really good film and it, it, it goes along, I, I watching it again recently, it, it, it goes at quite a pace. It's, it's amazing how quickly it's, it finishes and you don't feel that you've been cheated. I mean, it's 90 minutes, but it's, it goes quite quickly. Oh, yeah. No, it packs a lot into that 90, definitely. Um, yeah. And, uh, you, you know, this is one of, the, one of the few occasions as well where um, Stephen King is actually... Uh, you know, delighted with how this film came out, isn't he? Which, um, you know, he's always very vocal yeah. at the ones he doesn't like, but um, he's also very vocal about how he does like this uh, interpretation. Yeah, I was going to say he's very vocal for the ones he does like as well. Mm. No, absolutely. I think, it's, I think it's just the ones in between he's not bothered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's it's one of these films where, uh, I mean, especially at the time when um, every sort of high school film, they were all in their twenties or thirties. I mean, it's funny seeing uh, John Travolta in this because I think after this he went on to do Grease. Yes, I think he would have. Yeah, this was seventy six, <laughs> yeah. wasn't it? This film. So yes. yeah, 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 that would make sense. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny to see him. Um, well, I mean. In this film, he's not uh, high school. He's actually outside. He's, I guess, like he's an older boy who's dating um, um, Nancy Allen's uh, character, mm-hmm. who's a, who's a right proper bitch. Indeed, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, the casting's very good in this because all of the um, all of the roles, whether they're the main ones or the supporting ones, are. Uh, I, I, I think the acting and whatever in, in this is, it, you know, for the subject matter is actually pretty decent. And, yes. um, yeah. you, you know, obviously like putting some mother, real life mother and daughter casting as well with, with Amy Irving and Priscilla Pointer and whatever in there as, as, sna- as the snails and whatever. So, um, oh, okay. Um, okay. Y- you know, it's pr- pretty good, pretty good stuff. But uh, I thought for a second there you were going to say that uh, Piper Laurie and Sissy Spacek. Oh, no, like, no, 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 no. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> no, although, although they play it very well off each they other. They do play it very well. I mean, um, Piper Laurie is very good at it. I mean, she could have played it. It, 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 it comes across very creepy, that relationship. Oh, big and, time. Uh, yeah. You know, if, if that hadn't worked, I don't think you would again feel such sympathy for for the sissies for Carrie. Yeah. No, I mean I mean I think when I first th- th- this is one of those that until I um until later when I got to see it on video I probably had only seen sort of heavily edited for TV versions of this for quite some time. So I remember when I did when I did finally see the full movie I was y- y- you know I was surprised of how much more there was in it if you know what I mean. So, um, but yeah, I think this is, um, you, you know, I've always, this is another one I've always owned and uh, I think does stand up as a, I mean, I like De Palma anyway, but this this is one of those, again, when we were trying to 
come up with our De Palma picks, um, it was pretty tough because th- th- this was this was another one that was right up there for me, you know. Yes, yes, uh, I remember after doing that podcast that we had a few people going, "Why didn't you do Kerry?" Yeah, well, I mean, you know, there, there was again the, the list we got for this had you know <laughs> Carlito's yeah. way and Scarface and loads of De Palma stuff, which is awesome, and you know, um, yeah. But can't talk about all of them. <laughs> no, no, he <we> can't. <laughs> I think that would be a different podcast. It would. It would. <laughs> so let me ask then, in terms of of, of Carrie, um, mm-hmm. have you seen any of the other adaptations, whether they're sequels or remakes or reboots or whatever? Have you seen any of those films based well, on this? The, the thing is, um, when I was looking to, to watch this, I went to Netflix. Mm-hmm. And Netflix had every other version but this one. Oh my god, really? So it had the it had the, the TV movie. Right. It had the sequel. Yeah. And it had the remake. Right. And you know what? I haven't watched them. Right. Now I've heard that the remake doesn't do much to update it. If anything, it's very shot for shot like the Brian De Palma one. Yeah, they've kind only of is. just yeah. they've they I, I, all I know is it's the um the opening scene there's somebody with a, a phone filming it. Yes, yeah. I mean I I I've I've only seen it the once and um yeah, yeah they, they hadn't done too much to it to to change it significantly. I mean they'd contemporized it a little bit, obviously, as they do with these things. They'd obviously cast an actress that's sort of much closer to the age of the character. Um you know in the new version um but uh but yeah it's one of those things i i kind of wouldn't mind revisiting it but it didn't it didn't particularly it di- it didn't have the impact of de palmer's i felt it was well the thing is is it's all to do with the casting because um sissy spacek she she looks very plain jane and then when she's made up she looks absolutely stunning Chloe Grace Motes looks exactly the same throughout the whole film. Mm -hmm. She looks, you know, she's a lovely looking girl. And so you wouldn't think for any second that anybody would be picking on her. Yeah. So I I could, if say if I was cast in the remake, Mm -hmm. I would probably have cast her in the Nancy Allen role. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Because, I mean, you know, we're talking about, they, you know the actress who played Hit Girl and played Hit Girl very very well. <laughs> yeah. No, but seriously, I mean, you know, she she's somebody who can portray somebody who can take care of themselves. So in Carrie, she was somebody who couldn't take care of herself. She was a weakling. She was the one that everybody picked on because she was different. And that's the whole. That's why you're on her side, even when she's doing all these horrendous things. Uh-huh. So she starts off looking like, you know, a model or, you know, you know, that whole thing. Oh, my gosh, she's ugly. She's wearing glasses syndrome. Uh-huh. It, it, it doesn't work. Yeah. That's why it's, you know, it's not held in such high regard as the original is. No, absolutely. I mean, again, you know, you, you've got like uh, Julianne Moore plays the mother in the in the remake. And, you know, she's always always good value for money. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it just. For some reason, I watched it and it was just like, oh, yeah, yes, it's it's fine. And, yeah, I haven't actually gone back and, and revisited it since. But um, what I am intrigued about that I haven't seen at all, and I've got my reason for wanting to, is the um, the, the 2002 uh, television movie. And my reasons for wanting to see that is it was actually – Uh, written and produced by brian fuller who went on we we discussed it a little bit he went on to do the hannibal series that that, that we recently had and apparently this was supposed to be the pilot for a carry series that never materialized um right so i'm kind of intrigued actually to, to to take a look at it at some point but um again i haven't i haven't actually uh done that yet but um yeah yeah i don't know I don't, I don't know too much about that one. It always slightly confuses me a little bit. <laughs> um, so, you know, at the end, 
when after she stabbed her mother and they've fallen down the stairs and then the house starts falling in on itself. Yep. Now, I obviously, I've not read the book, so I heard somewhere that it's actually fall, it's collapsing in because stones are raining down on it. Hence why when you see the um, the dream sequence at the end, that her gravestone is covered with in rocks. In stones, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it, I have to say, it wasn't very clear. It did look like it was sort of a precursor to the po- the house in Portergeist being, you know, demolished. In Portergeist cases, being sucked into a vortex. Mm. Oh, it's quite similar, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was one of those things where it wasn't quite clear what was happening. It, it, you know, why would the house suddenly start collapsing in on herself like that? I mean, this. I mean, I guess you could say that um, it was Carrie White, you know, the, the guilt of her killing her mother, you know, made her, her subconscious used her power to do that. Or, I don't know, but it was a bit unclear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what the answer to that is. I see it just like you do, really, that, that you know, it's mm. kind of done. I mean, and of course, obviously that, you know, the whole ending is 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 set up for that sort of... Um, you know, shock jump ending, which was which was kind of yes. a classic at the time, wasn't it? <laughs> well, I think it was one of the first films to do it, yeah. and it was very much uh, copied. I know um, Friday the Thirteenth did a similar, yeah, um, shock ending. Actually, I think if memory serves, they didn't do that on the remake. That is one of the things they did change. Oh, I right. think. Um, as I'm never going to watch it, what do they do? I can't the remember. I'm just remake? trying to think. Um, <laughs> it was that good. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I don't really. Uh, hold on, I don't really remember. But uh, so they haven't left it open for a sequel, have they? No, I. Uh, hold on. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, she visits the grave. Puts the head. Yeah, I can't remember. I can't remember. I know, I know, oh, I, know right. I know she visits the grave, but there's not there's not the hand scene. That's for sure. Right. But I don't know. I think maybe the grave, the, the gravestone cracks or something. But oh, something right. happens. But oh, it's okay. not the same, same. jump yeah. ending. Yeah. It's not. It's not what you expect there to be. You know. I have to say though, in the original, that the ending shot is brilliantly shot because it's uh, night for day. Mm-hmm. And everything's in reverse. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yes. So it gives it that really bizarre sort of dreamlight feel. And um, yeah, yeah, you can see in the background, you do see a car <laughs> driving the other backwards. Way, yeah. But other, other than that, it's pretty seamless. But no, but it adds to it, though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know whether it was intentional, but you're right. It does kind of add to yeah. the weirdness of it. And um, it works rather nicely. The scene in the actual prom itself is is really well handled. I mean, the use of split screen, but also that very long one shot mm-hmm. that goes past everybody and around people and then up to the the bucket of blood. Absolutely. Now, I mean, this is what, well, you, you know, I mean, we've talked, you, you know, when we were talking um, a couple of podcasts back uh, where we were saying about, uh, I think it was Frank Oz, we were talking about how he doesn't, he doesn't have a, you know, he does all sorts of different genre of film, but doesn't yeah. have a particular style as such. Whereas, you know, De Palma is a very showy director. There's, there's no doubt about that. You know, he's oh, yes. very much so. Um, yes, a friend of mine said he's very good at um, keepy uppy, but he could never do a full ninety minutes. Yeah, well, that that's yeah, I get it's fair enough. Which I, mean, I, I, I never totally kind of agree agreed with him on till the truth. Yeah, on some I, things, I, I, yeah. On some some of the films, yeah, I mean, like a film like Snake Eyes, yeah, I totally agree. But I mean, there was a lot more films that worked. Yeah, well, this is certainly one of them. <laughs> yeah, and oh, and you're right. I mean, this is the thing that sort of launched him into the big leagues because, that, as you rightly said, he'd been doing and experimenting with, um, you, you know, films for quite some time. But it, it was it was Carrie that really sort of put him on the roadmap and and you know led to led to all those things that followed and. Um, uh, you know, as far as as far as Stephen King adaptations go, uh, although when we did that podcast, we didn't necessarily pick this as our best one, but it's certainly up there, isn't it? Definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's that was our personal choices, hmm. but uh, at least we got to come back and talk about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm glad we have. I'm I'm glad you picked it. I was pleased when you said I was like, oh, good. I'm glad you, I'm glad you picked that one because it gives us a, 
a chance to sort of revisit it um, and, uh, you, you know, at least have some say on it. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's cool. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, anyone who's listening that hasn't seen this, I highly recommend that you do because, it, you know, um, it is a it, it is a well-crafted uh, horror film and it is a really good adaptation of that book. Right. Well, let's move on. <laughs> now we're going to pick our movie house. Yeah. So, Keith, All right. what was your pick for movie house? Well, again, like I said, because there were so many in that list, um, you, you know, it being hard to pick a, a movie heaven, um, I actually did find it equally as hard to pick a movie hell, simply because <laughs> there wasn't a lot on the list that I didn't like. Um, there was only one film on the list that I hadn't seen. Um, yeah. And everything else, um, I didn't really have any major issues with. Um, so I went with what, you know, I remembered to not be very good. And on on revisiting it, it's like, well, yeah, it doesn't quite work, but it's not necessarily an awful film. And um, that's, I'm afraid, another Brian De Palma film. It is actually Femme Fatale from 2002 which was picked by Andy Lunn. Again, I don't know Andy, but, um, uh, <laughs> you, you know, thank you thank you for putting this up there as a, a choice. I don't know whether you think it's heaven or hell, but uh, I, I picked it for movie hell. Um, my, 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 reason, my reason for picking this, uh, I, I yeah. had only watched it the once and I've revisited it. And there's, the, you know, there's, there's a lot of quite good things in this. I mean, it's very De Palma in many, many, mm. many ways. Yeah. However, yeah. however, um, it does have one, <laughs> one kind of story flaw. And if this is the thing you were saying about your, uh, your friend that said that he can do the, what was it, the build up, but not the straight 90 or whatever it was. Oh, um, uh, keep you up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I would say this is, this is probably a good example of that, actually. Um, what it is. Uh, it, it's back to one of his sort of erotic thriller mystery type films. Um, it stars uh, Rebecca Romjan Stamos, who uh, had obviously the gorgeous, I might add, Rebecca, who um, had obviously, you know, sort of shot to fame with with playing Mystique in Brian Singer's X-Men film uh, just a couple of years before. Um and obviously, which has been rebooted with Jennifer Lawrence uh, playing a sort of younger version. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, in this, in, in all her sort of natural blonde beauty. Um, and also Antonio Banderas, who uh, apparently I've read actually did this film. Um, he was persuaded by his, his Mrs. Melanie Griffiths to do it because obviously De Palma had given her her break with 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 some of his early films like Body Double. Um, yeah. And, uh, you, you know, obviously him being a very stylistic director, uh, thought it thought it might be a a, a, a good film uh, to do. Um, it's, it's quite an ambitious film. Uh, it starts off. I mean, again, we've got everything in this. We've got long, long, long camera shots. We've got overhead tracking we've got split screen um you, you know we've got slow-mo we've 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 got the use of all the things that you know De Palma likes to have in his sort of arsenal of of filmmaking techniques well yeah I mean this I mean I absolutely enjoyed the opening sequence yes. the the robbery at Cannes, at the Cannes Film Festival yeah which and was, was amazing it was it was amazing because um it looked like they were actually shooting it as the festival was going yeah. on. Now, I've seen a few films where they've had, like, you know, they filmed during the festival. Um, I remember Mr. Bean's Holiday filmed at the festival and uh, a few other films as well. Oh, like um, What Just Happened yeah, with Robert De Niro. Yeah. But this is the first one that actually had, like, a, a robbery going on. Yeah. And uh, it was kind of funny because he he it did like he taken the things he'd learned from doing Mission Impossible and he threw them in there a little bit because you did have the guy down the pipe on the wires trying to knock out um, a fuse or something, wasn't he? That's right. Pole. That's right. No, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, no, I mean it's very well set up. It's it's got you mm. know it's, it's essentially a diamond heist, but the diamonds are in the form of a 
uh, a very revealing dress that an- that another stunningly beautiful woman is wearing um, at yes. this, and um, she is she is basically seduced by um, uh, Rebecca, who's who's sort of posing as a photographer at this um, at this Cannes film event, and uh, you know she's sort of seduced by her and taken off into a into um, a, a flashy toilet cubicle. Uh, where, well, I was. It's funny you say seduced because she says one thing to her, and then off she goes. Well, yeah, but then, <laughs> but then it's Rebecca. <laughs> but when we find out that she's in cahoots anyway, yes. I mean, that was actually that was that was kind of that was a nice reveal of what actually happened because you just thought that she, um, because um, Rebecca's character double crosses the other guys in the the gang. Mm-hmm. And uh, it does look like that she's given them a fake, and she's stolen the yeah, real one. Yeah, she's ones. done a switcheroony, which is Roo, yeah. which is which is one of the twists in this that does work. Um, although yeah, there are yeah. many twists in this that actually don't, which is which is kind of the problem. Yeah, with with, yeah. with the film, as it were. So so it starts, as I said, with a very very stylized, nicely shot heist. Um, and yes, you, you're absolutely right in in the vein of of what he'd done very well for the Mission Impossible franchise, um, you, you know, a few years earlier. And, you know, this is all obviously because it takes place in Cannes. You know, there's a lot of the action that takes place in, in other parts of France. It, it goes to Paris, etc. cetera. Um, and basically there's, there's, this, there's a doppelganger. So, again, it's another one of these themes there. There's So... Rebecca's right. essentially playing sort of yeah. two roles in this. <laughs> yes. Well, let, let, let's set up. So what happens is, she, so she's on the run from the rest of the gang and uh, she gets recognised by this elderly couple who thinks that she's her daughter. And I thought, oh, okay, obviously the the daughter must have disappeared quite a while ago or something. Mm-hmm. And um, what happens is that one of the gang men- members finds her and actually throws her off a balcony and she happens to say land on something soft. But the couple are there and they take her away and they take her back home. And so she wakes up yeah. in this house she's never been in before. Well, yeah, I mean, basically, we find out that the the, the person that they think she is um, had basically uh, lost her husband and daughter in a in a car accident, I believe, if memory serves. Yeah. And, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, you know, had gone into a depression and, and kind of disappeared. Um, and, y- y- you know, they, they think because she's a dead ringer, uh, they, they think this is her. Um, and then she, she ends up having this, uh, bath, uh, scene where, uh, the, the, the real, I think the character's called Lily, isn't it? The real Lily, um, returns home, uh, and basically does commit suicide in front of, uh, Rebecca's other character. (laughs) So the, the, the one, the, 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 the criminal uh rebecca um sees lily the one she's mistaken for commit suicide um so as as a result she decides to sort of take take her life on so it's one of these mistaken identities but she sees this as a way out of being um you know followed and 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 hunted by uh you you know these people that she double crossed right i have to say this before yes first time watching it i thought that they were the same character and she was having a flashback Mm -hmm. that she was seeing herself with the gun yeah and then so i thought that maybe you were going to see that either she didn't pull the trigger and just ran out or that that it was like a grazing shot which may have led to amnesia and we find out that actually this thief is actually this girl Mm -hmm. and she's been living this other life all this time but no but (laughs) that's not what happens but yes so she takes on 
this other woman's life yes and finds her way back to the states well th this is where it starts becoming yeah. problem problematic now in my view because mm -hmm. suddenly we j yeah. we jump 7 years ahead and yes she is now the uh, wife of an uh, American ambassador living in France, who's played by Peter Coyote. And, yeah. um, and then this is where Antonio Banderas comes in because he's kind of... Well, actually, he did come in a bit earlier because he took a photograph of Rebecca's character on the steps of the church. Seven years earlier, he, yeah. Seven years earlier because um, he's... It, well, he's a he's a, a paparazzi photographer, but he's also an artist, and he's making this massive collage yes. of photographs he's taken over days of this area. But he's trying to find that one piece that will make it special. Yeah, which is actually, I have to say, that bit. I mean, like like, like I mm. said, you know, I'm, I'm revisiting it. I thought actually, this is not so bad after all, and it's certainly a well-made movie. And that is actually quite yeah. a nice bit of production design, I have to say. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, to, to a point that do you actually see a, a lot of that montage at the end of the uh, of uh, the over the end credits? Yeah, yeah. Yes, so she's back in France, and what it is is that uh, the paper wants to get a photograph of her because she's very press shy. Yeah, she's done everything within her power to stay out of the press for obvious reasons. Yes, and uh, yeah. of, of course, you know she's she's this ambassador's wife, etc. So yes, he he is sent on a um, uh, a job. To, to try and get this picture of her, which which she does, and 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 you know th this picture ends up, um, y you know, being on uh, billboards, etc. And what this means is the by this time the people she's double crossed from the heist seven years earlier have, have, have got out of of um, jail now. They've got out on parole or whatever, and they see this picture and. Um, it kind of that it exposes her somewhat, and um, actually, you know, that they they go in search of, don't they? And yes, um, they do, yeah. And this is where it all gets a bit fantastical and and a and a, and a tad <laughs> confusing. Because... Well, uh, I well, a confusing. The fantastical bit comes later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> but uh, go on. Well, there's this uh, there's this truck accident, isn't there? Where um, the 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 woman that she'd done the heist with <laughs> the, the 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 two gang members find the her accomplice the. Who we assumed is the person that's pawned off the uh, the jewels, the this gold dress thing, and um, and so they f they throw her in front of a truck, which I have to say was very nasty. Mm. Oh, definitely, yeah, very yeah. nasty. Yeah. So so she is killed, and yeah. um, uh, and 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 basically at this. At this point, she decides to try and frame Antonio Banderas's character, um, yeah, for her own sort of staged kidnapping. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit. It's a bit it's, heavy handed. What well, it is because it it, it it all is based upon the fact that he has to do certain things, and if he didn't do those certain things, he just wouldn't be. You know, it just wouldn't work. There has to be too many contrivances in place, you know. I mean, the fact that he goes back and finds her because he f he's sympathetic. Sorry that he took that, those photographs. And I'm sure it helps that she's smoking hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so she plays up that she's sort of suicidal and also that she's not well. And uh, him being a gentleman decides to um, go to the chemist to get a stomach. And that's when she decides to call the police on him. Yes. Yeah. And he gets arrested and, and um, yeah, taken into this whole thing. So, you know, he's been the yeah. sort of, uh, well, somewhat innocent bystander. Um, but, you know, this, this, this convoluted plan that she had in yeah. place um, uh, kind of 
kind of works and and, and gets him into this uh well yeah i mean what happens is the police um take him to see the ambassador and the ambassador doesn't want to press any charges and that when you when you see that you think oh okay he must be a really nice bloke <laughs> and uh his, his aide sort of you know ushers them out and stuff and doesn't want to know anymore and of course and antonio banderas wants to find out more so he again searches rebecca's character out and finds her and she reveals to him that it's one big plot to you know make it look like she's been kidnapped that her husband's going to give her the money so she can you know escape Go the country off. and not yeah. be found with this with this uh with this fortune and uh, etc yeah. and uh it, then they have that really weird i mean this is this is this is a little bit de palma you know doing it for for just the sake of it i mean this this film yeah this film for a de palma film doesn't have uh actually hardly any nudity in it but you do have that um uh you know very sensual erotic uh strip scene which seemed to be sort of put in there for the sake of it in some respects at that really awkward um bar that yeah. they're at <laughs> yeah and which i guess i guess yeah. by the time you know the end of the film it kind of makes sense on a level but when you're watching it at the time you're thinking what the hell is going on here <laughs> she's just a randy lady she just wanted to you know so she just yes. wanted to have some sex and uh she didn't mind if it was with uh, Antonio Banderas or this, you know, French lowlife. Yeah, this strange guy, this kind of yeah, yeah, a, a yeah, part biker yeah. type guy. But um, yeah. uh, but but Antonio Banderas actually, you know, he sees a way out here. Uh, yes. um, interestingly, because this is kind of the future at this point, when from when the film was made, isn't it? That he had a. Uh, uh, a mini disc recording device. <laughs> oh god! <laughs> well, I, I gather that it um, the the seven years later, I think, was probably two thousand and two. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I guess. I, I mean, it it, it it says seven years later. It don't look seven years. Well, no, later. And, and weirdly, nobody's really aged or anything. No, and, they're and not when they changed their can, hairstyle or when anything. It can I think it says two thousand or something for the film? festival or something like that but any anyway yeah wh whatever I mean, oh right but i mean it's that's just a, that's just a, a piece of detail that's in the background yeah that's the least of the problems really with this <laughs> yeah. so so of course yeah. when when uh they sort of set up for the husband to come and deliver this ransom um antonio banderas kind of has this this moment where he he reveals the scheme and he's he's got it recorded uh as i yeah. said on on this uh, her giving the whole plan he, he's got recorded the whole time they then they she gets thrown off 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 the bridge doesn't she and, and, right and no this is wait, wait 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 okay she shoots peter coyote and then she shoots, does. Yes, and, she shoots yes, yes she does absolutely and she then shoots antonia banderas who's holding and a gun with no bullets yeah and and it's then when the the two gangsters turn up and then yes she gets thrown off the bridge she gets now this is where it all becomes a bit this is where it really doesn't work this is the yeah this is the fantastical bit because now it's revealed in this sort of twist ending that as i said is, is the bit that sort of lets it down really that uh everything we've been watching since her having the bath at the apartment of, of Lily. So this, this doppelganger she has, you know, seven years earlier has all been a dream. <laughs> it's, it's the Bobby Ewing effect. <laughs> it's all been a dream. <laughs> and she wakes up oh. and obviously she wakes up at the point where Lily, this, this, you know, suicidal woman who looks like her, that's lost her husband and child comes back to kill herself but now she she plays things out differently and she actually um stops her from from committing yes. suicide how she stops her by committing suicide is telling her that she's gonna get on a flight and meet a man and her life is gonna work out pretty well exactly because she's and had this thinking, premonition <laughs> what the fuck yes now it is you seriously going 
what the fuck? It is. And, 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 <laughs> and, 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 and if that isn't enough, it actually yeah. goes a step even further. <laughs> yes, this is, this is so funny. So you see Lily getting a van. A van. Yes. Get, get ready for this. The van. And, yes. And she's... Oh, no, no. Let's, let's not spoil it. Let's, let's build up to it. So she gets into a van with a, a, a gentleman who's talking and you're thinking now in any other film this would just been she would jump in the car and she'd be driving off and it would have been focused on her and you wouldn't hear anything from the driver but then the driver has lines and you're like whoa what the hell what's going on here and he's saying how much he likes her necklace and she tells her about it being her daughter's necklace and um and of course and she's he he says, "Oh, where can I buy one of these? My daughter would really love it." And she gives it to him. <laughs> and, and, and he she, hangs she, it. On she the says mirror. something like, hang, "He hangs it on the mirror." I was just hang it on the mirror, and you know, you can think of your daughter. It's, it's something really <laughs> crappy. Anyway, so then we jump seven years in the future. Yes, again, and we again, and we revisit the the the, the scene where the accomplice gets murdered. But it plays out a lot different this time mm. because um, Rebecca's character is there and she she seems to be a nicer person now. Oh, yes. She's a changed person. She's, she's not such a, yeah, she's not such a bitch anymore. No, that was only in, a, <laughs> that was only in her dream. Was she a bitch? Only in her dream. Yeah. And um, and so she meets up with her, her cohort who turns out to be the girl from Cannes. Yes, the one with the diamond dress. Who actually? What happened was she walked out with the real diamond dress. Mm-hmm. They did a switch, a Rooney, a switch, a switch, a double switch, mm. <laughs> and of course the two gang members turn up. But what happens this time <laughs> is that the van comes around the corner, and the sun <laughs> glints off the necklace, blinding <laughs> the two gangsters, who then fall back into these two spikes, killing themselves. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. It, it, this this bit really is like I mean it's it's nicely shot, but it's not good. Antonio Banderas captures the whole thing on fo- in photographs and puts it in his montage. In his co- yeah, in his collage. Yeah, and, and, and obviously meets um meets Rebecca and that that it's one of the cheesiest endings ever. I hate this where yeah. They're walking together, and he and and you know he, he says about buying her a drink or something, and he goes, uh, you, "You kind of remind me of someone." And she goes, "Oh, maybe it's someone from your dreams or something like that." Is the last <laughs> line, and it's like a real groaner. So, um, so yeah, 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 th- yeah. This this film, it, you know, it's 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 a well made, well crafted film, but. It, it, it's flawed. It doesn't work. I mean, it's one. It's one too many twists, and it's just yeah. It, and also, it just it's so far out of you know normal common sense. Yeah, it's it's so silly. I mean, I don't know. I've, I don't know if that was how it was written, or if that was a rewrite, or you know, it's just like how can we end this? Yeah. Well, what's interesting with this one? Is this film yeah. is actually written by? I mean, a lot of the films that, that of Brian De Palma's, he he adapts and directs, and you know does a very good job of, like he did in the aforementioned yeah. Carrie, for example, which was obviously yeah. Stephen King's um, story. But in this particular instance, Brian De Palma wrote this film as well, and I just think that uh. Uh, that's you know he's 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 a very good director, and the idea of this film. Um, you, you know, it, it's sort of good in terms of premise. <laughs> uh, you, you know, the mistaken identity, the the voyeurism, that you know, all the things that he sort of plays along with. But it, it just when, when when it's executed, it just you know just doesn't make sense because, as I said, you've got you've got a dream sequence, then you've got you know a couple of different twists on twists, and it's just. It's just a bit of a mess. So I, I actually felt that the, uh, the first half of the film was 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 pretty decent. Actually, um, it looked nice. It was it was you know fairly well performed and 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 you know certainly nicely shot and whatever. But the the the, the payoff to it was was just 
ridiculous and and laughable frankly so and self-indulgent i mean that's, oh, very. I mean, that's what i was trying to say is you know hearing that he wrote it himself it's very self-indulgent yeah. so it's, it's kind of like trying to get you know everything into one film and really it should have just have been about one thing yeah instead of all that so yeah it was um i have to say i mean it was it's certainly i would have it was one of those films that I wish I could have gone, we could both have gone to the cinema to see it and then we could have talked about it immediately afterwards because we could have had the best conversation ever, the longest conversation ever, trying to figure out what was going on and stuff. I think also the fact that making it, because if it had been, say, not so clear about it being a dream, that was maybe something else maybe you, uh, i don't know but you know imagine if david lynch had done this film yeah yeah no absolutely the the, the answers wouldn't have been so clear cut no and, and this is one of the problems and that, you might that might have worked for this story yeah i mean this is one of the problems with this it was almost like trying to be too clever for its own good because a lot of the stuff yes. that it had done in the in the seven years that were the the the, the dream sequence, if you like, <laughs> it, it, it when you when you actually look back on it and think about it, they'd set some stuff up design wise quite quite cleverly because obviously, yeah. you you know when you realise it's a dream and you sort of read into it, you think, oh okay, well that. Can, but the trouble is, it, it, this is the problem. By the time people have got to the end, I'm sure that they don't really want to. <laughs> think about go back and sort of revisit that so it's almost trying to be too clever for its own good and you've got way too many twists and coincidences in this uh just to make it sort of hang together and um yeah i i just think it lets itself down it's it's, it's a good setup it's it's exactly what you said your friend said about it's um it, it's yeah. good but it does it doesn't go the full the full you know 10 yards or whatever it, it, it stops short of that and um yeah that's why and this is kind of what i remembered of it so it's why i chose it as movie hell from a, from a list that, <laughs> that that was pretty much decent film so um yeah you, you know uh yeah i i think this is this is a weaker um a weaker film although it, this does truly have his style and his, his shooting and editorial and narrative style, um, you, you know, throughout. And, uh, you, you, you know, the, the, the performances aren't too bad. Um, but as I said, it's just, it's just, it's just too much. This ending, it, it's just relying on too many twists and too much coincidence. And, uh, particularly when you get to the whole, um, you know, necklace sunlight blinding <laughs> causing the truck to, to, to make the guys jump out the way and all this sort of thing it, it's just it's just a bit uh it's just a bit ridiculous really and and a, and a cheesy line to end on where she says oh, only you look like you know you recognize me like we've met before or something and she says only in my dreams and it's like oh please come on <laughs> you could do better than that <laughs> yes oh indeed so there you right. go we got there god i was there worried you we weren't going to get through that but we got through it <laughs> Well, I have to say it, it's it's an interesting film. It's something you can certainly talk about, and I'm sure it has its fans. But I know my pick. I wouldn't say it's the same. <laughs> I would definitely would not say it's the same. <laughs> right, uh, my pick for movie hell is mm. Space Truckers, which was picked by Ben Woodywis. Mm. And um, was this picked by Ben because he likes it or hates it? Let me just say this first. When we were doing the Stuart Gordon episode with Mike Tack, me and Mike Tack, um, I picked Robo Jocks. This was my second choice for movie hell. Why I went with Robo Jocks was I had a, 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 a bit more of a relationship with it. it. My expectations were built very high for that film and, um, you know, was let down by the final film. Space Trackers, on the other hand, um, I remember seeing the ad adverts on the on the videos and stuff. Thinking, well, this looks interesting. The special effects looked really good, and they are, actually have to say the best thing about this film is the special effects in it. 
especially the, all the space stuff is top notch mm-hmm. model work shame about the story <laughs> yeah i mean th- this was this was the one film on the list um that had come through from listeners and this was the only film i hadn't seen okay and um i have to say through through, through my life i've certainly wasted some money over the years with with different things <laughs> and this film um uh, i couldn't actually find anywhere and 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 you know i i don't want to be a hypocrite when it comes to uh, illegal downloads and things like that so i couldn't find this film by any sort of uh legal means so um i ended up buying it uh, i bought the uh italian version uh off of amazon and i paid 15 pounds for it okay and I have to say, it's probably the worst fifteen pounds I've ever spent in my entire life. Because, um, you, you know, I don't mind schlock sci-fi stuff. I mean, I like everything from, you know, Butt Rogers in the twenty-fifth century to Star Crash, for God's <laughs> sake, you know. Uh, but this <laughs> was just dreadful. <laughs> so i will let you continue but i i just want to oh, okay. with that straight away that uh, um i'll save you the pain yes yes right um it the film starts off with a moon base being attacked by an unknown assailant which turns out to be this killer droid and the thing is it takes out a lot of troops and vehicles and stuff and uh it gets to the last two men played by you have the the president of the company played by Shane Rimmer and Charles Dance yeah what the hell was he doing man <laughs> well he was certainly um you know playing that pup role up as much as he could he certainly yeah um uh, it looked like it was uh, a bit of a cameo at the beginning and uh, mm-hmm. of course it's not it turns out to be a big role but uh, it turns out that it was a test of this uh, of this killer robot, and um, the president of the company wants to use it against Earth. He hands, and he doesn't want anybody to know about this, so he uses the droid to kill Charles Dance's character. Hence, why you think he's not in it for the rest of the film? Mm, you think, wow, that cameo! Was, that must have been a nice paycheck for a cameo. Ah, uh, we wish. <laughs> so. Then cut to credits, space truckers. Oh. Space truckers? I mean, if you went into this film cold, not knowing what it was called, and you see that opening sequence, you think, oh, this is going to be a war film. You know, mm-hmm. it's going to be humans against killer robots. It's going to be great. And then it goes space truckers, and you see a truck in space. Mm. And you think, oh, okay. So we get introduced to Dennis Hopper's character, who we learn is the only independent trucker out there because everybody else has sponsorship from different companies and he's flying to the spaceport and now i'm saying the special effects in this look really good yeah actually, mean, the spaceport the truck everything yeah, looked great the truck actually reminded me of the um uh, the gemini freighter colonial movers from battlestar galactica you know in terms of its <laughs> design because obviously it was a cargo uh, ship wasn't it so yes. yeah and actually because um, to start with i was thinking oh okay maybe but mm. <laughs> are we talking original or new well actually they, they used that in both it was it was in the right. original but it was one of those little easter eggs that they stick into the oh, reimagined right. as well but uh, that's a whole nother podcast is that the is that the ship that had like um the like the circles on it like had three circles. No, no, that's, this, this, no. This is the one that was basically like uh, it looked. It, well, it looked like that, like a lot like that right. truck ship, basically. Okay. Yeah. Right. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. I need to go back and watch the classic Battlestar Galactica. Oh, it's it. good stuff, man. It's good stuff. <laughs> yeah, this better than this film. Oh god. Yeah. No. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, we get introduced to the the world of trucking and. Um, yeah, Dennis Hopper's character is having a problem uh, with George Went, who's uh, running a, I guess it's a chain of restaurants or something, and he's hauling square pigs. 
<laughs> these big square pigs. Yes. You know, because, you know, the, I guess in the future, genetically modified food has really become Frankenstein food. Because these don't look very healthy pigs. I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat at that place, not at all. No, it looked pretty nasty. Yes. Yeah. So they get in a quarrel about money and uh jo- george wentz character is offering too too little and so he's trying to sort of steal the cargo off dennis hopper and but you know dennis hopper he's a he's a seasoned trucker he knows what he's doing and you know he, he forts their attempts i mean that lovely bit about throwing a punch in zero space <laughs> yeah yeah and so he we we get to see the space station and we meet uh, a character played by debbie mazer and uh dennis hopper is always trying to you know propose to her trying to get her to marry him and stuff like that and why wouldn't he absolutely yeah i mean she's just flirting she's just working there trying to make her way back to earth because she needs to pay her mum's medical bills i did quite like the idea of the um they had like the diner that was curved around the yeah sort of circumference right, yeah. of the um y- you know ship or whatever i thought that was that was actually quite an interesting little design idea yeah yeah they they had they looked like they took the habitation ring from 2001 yes. and then just throw it just made it really dirty and cheesy <laughs> <laughs> yeah turn it into a diner yeah <laughs> Anyway, we get to meet Stephen Dorff's character, who's a young trucker who's trying to, you know, he's he's keen, he wants to get in there and, and stuff like that. So circumstances happen that um, Dennis Hopper has is going to haul this illegal freight back to Earth. And he needs to do it within a short amount of time. There's a deadline. So he takes Debbie Moser's character, who agrees to marry him if he does this, and he takes Stephen Dorff as like a partner. And uh, so they fly out into space and uh, they go through um, this dark area where nobody goes because there's pirates and there's a lot of wrecks and stuff. And it turns out that there's black ice out there, <laughs> They're like black asteroids, which they crash into and disable the ship. And... Uh, unfortunately ruptures the heating system so that this means that while dennis hopper is outside fixing the ship uh debbie mazer and steve dorf get to take the clothes off yeah they get to be oily and half naked yes yes <laughs> <laughs> not gratuitous at all <laughs> no no and I, I remember when this came out this was a pg I mean, it's, I guess it's been reclassified because on IMDb it's a 12 now, but uh, I remember at the time on VHS it was a PG and I was like, ooh, okay. It's just very saucy. Well, I mean, to be fair, they're only down to underwear, yeah. aren't they? But yeah, yeah. But, yes, but, but still, still. Yes. Still. Anyway, so um, they get captured by pirates and we learn that uh, the captain is Charles Dance. He somehow survived being vaporized by his own creation. And um, he's uh, rebuilt himself. Mm. He's a new man. And this is where I'm more surprised about it being a PG, actually, where this ends up leading. (laughs) So um, they have a policy of of killing the crews that they they actually uh, board, their ships and stuff. And uh, and Debbie Mazer um, offers herself or Charles Dance offers her the way to save her friends and she takes it and she's taken up to the captain's cabin where, uh, um, yeah, he's, uh, as we see, he's not a fully functioning man and uh, he's built himself a few devices to replace the things he's missing. Is this instead of robot robo jocks, it's robo cocks, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it could have been chainsaw cock because he, the amount of time he was trying to get that motor running. <laughs> I, I, I mean, you know, absolutely. For a PG thirteen, this is actually quite close to the mark, isn't it? This bit, yeah. Because there's a sen- yeah. and the other thing that's nasty is it's essentially, in some respects, a bit of a 
not that it happened, but it's a bit of a rape scene as well, isn't it? It's it's kind of well, she's agreed to it, yeah. and he offers her a few either drugs or drinks or anything just to make it you know a bit easier on her. Yeah. And she's like, no, I just want to get this over and done. What with. was Charles Dance <laughs> doing? I mean, I just don't get it. I don't get why he did this. He must have got paid. Most of the budget of this film must have gone to him, surely. <laughs> Maybe, or he was a fan of the director. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, Stuart Gordon has made some very good films. Right. This certainly isn't one. <laughs> I mean, his, his Lovecraft adaptations are really yeah, good. Yes, so I've heard. I need to watch them. I've not seen them, to be fair. And as I say, it's a good looking film. I mean, effects wise, it's it's good looking. Mm. But, uh, you know, story wise, it's all let down, really. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I mean, what happens is that um, they, the pirates, they, they're, they're trying to break into the cargo. And the thing is, the cargo has sort of a self defense system. Uh, on the outside, they've actually got lasers. Uh, and then when they were able to sort of take out the lasers, uh, the killer robots start appearing and they sort of take on the crew. And this gives the uh, Dennis Hopper and Debbie Mars and Stephen Dorff a chance to escape, which they do. But of course, now they've got a problem that on this truck, they've got all these killer robots. And every time they, you know, deactivate or destroy one, there's three more come you know or activate so it starts one three six you know it keeps going and going so more and more you know are activated mm -hmm. and we get a bit of um exposition from charles dance explaining this to them because somehow he was able to crawl onto the ship even though he's missing his legs and he gives them a device that deactivates them something you see the president use at the beginning of the film mm -hmm. And so um, they get to Earth and they realize that they have to destroy the cargo and they can't disconnect. So um, Dennis Hopper makes the ultimate sacrifice. He, he drives his truck straight into the atmosphere, hoping, you know, that it will burn up the, his, his truck and his cargo and everything. And... Stephen Dorff and Debbie Marzer have been put into a skate pod and they land and you can see they're looking up in the sky and you can see the fire trail and then the, the truck explodes and you think, oh shit. Oh no, Dennis Hopper, he's dead. Nah. Yeah, I was going to say that would have been too bold a choice for this, wouldn't it? Yeah, he, he survived. Mm. And then we get the, the sort of last scenes of the film. So they... They, they end up at Debbie Mars's mum's um, hospital. And it uh, turns out that it's uh, Barbara Crampton. Oh, right. Yes. A very young Barbara Crampton because she's been frozen. So she's, you know, she's actually in good shape. And uh, Dennis Hopper, you know, he, he's kind of happy that he got Debbie Marser out. You know, he said, oh, I don't, you know, I, I'm going to free you from your your agreement to marry me and you know for his good deeds you know he gets the hook up with barbara crampton there you <laughs> which go. Is, i guess it's not a bad deal not a bad deal uh but we meet the president of earth who turns out he is the bad guy he is the president of the company and uh in usual fashion for you know no good deed goes unpunished um he pays all the medical bills for uh, the mother, um, gives Dennis Hopper a new truck, and gives him a whole lot of money not to talk about it. But he is a, of course, he's an evil dick. Um, there's a bomb in the the suitcase with the money, which uh, Stephen Dorff decides he doesn't want anything to do with the money. Throws it out the window, which just happens to land on the president's limo, and boom, kills him. You would think this would probably make these guys, you know, Wanted. I know, a public enemy number <laughs> <Yes>. one, <laughs> but no. No, nope, they get they all get launched out into space in a new truck on the <laughs> on the sort of the main rockets you would see uh, the shuttle being launched. Mm -hmm. And they all, they blast off into space at the end. 
Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's 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 a it's a shame. It's it, it is there was a much better story there somewhere trying to to crawl its way out. And uh, yeah, I mean, even though there's, there's some nice touches, I mean, you get Vernon Wells as a character as one of the pirates, and it's always good to see Vernon Wells in a film, even though he never gets that much to do since like Commando and uh, Man Max Two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, I have to say, I, I I watched this, but it was one of those films I really struggled to watch. I, I know I was like yes. on my phone, checking things and you know looking at other. I I wasn't fully engaged with it. I was quite distracted, and um, yeah, I just wasn't my my sort of thing at all. And as I said, I you know, I, I'm into my sort of share of uh, cheap and cheesy you know sci-fi stuff but this i just thought was way too silly and um yeah yeah i mean i agree some of some of the some of the design and some of the effects weren't too bad um but the actual um, story and also the performances you know even though we've got some good actors in there i just i just thought it was all a bit uh, a bit cringeworthy really <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I thought Dennis Hopper was all right. Yeah, um, he wasn't trying, but you know, compared to, compared to everybody else, he's he was the better actor. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, it's a sort of um, bit of a disappointment. Mm. No, it's definitely movie hell, yeah, big time. And as yeah. I said, I'm I'm kind of. You know, I purchased the film, and um, <laughs> I've got no, I've got no <laughs> desire to keep it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I won't be watching it again, yes. and there were no extras on it, so <laughs> there's not even that to, uh, to 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 keep me interested. But uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, um, you know, it, he's clearly he's done films. Stuart Gordon's done films on on much lower budgets, which are much better films. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think this one was low budget as well. Right. I mean, he's he tends his budgets tend to be quite low. Right. I'm seeing how much it cost. Uh, oh, twenty five million. This one. Wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. That is quite a a step up from his earlier work. Yeah. But yeah, it's you tend to get these films, don't you? Where um, they concentrate a lot more on the special effects and not the story. I mean, it's kind of in some ways reminded me a bit of like Lost in Space and what a wasted opportunity that was. Although I'd rather sit <laughs> through that than this, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, God no, no. That's that's just that's just an awful film. And also the it 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 doesn't look that great now. The CGI in it is awful, especially that yellow creature that keeps changing color. Mm. Oh yeah. And that annoying creature, yes. He was the Jar Jar before Jar Jar. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, this was definitely out of, the, out of the list of films that our listeners sent through, as I said, which there were some great films from some, you know, great directors on there. This was by far the uh, the worst film on that list, <laughs> in my opinion, yes. anyway. <laughs> um, yes, I don't think there know. was any... Uh, I think Femme Fatale was even. Oh God, Femme, Femme Fatale. Femme Fatale, <laughs> as I said, it's, it's got its problems, but it's 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 not a it's not a bad movie. Um, but yes, this this is pretty pretty awful, I have to say. And you know, and you know, I'm quite forgiving with stuff. But uh... <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So it has to be really bad. Well, if you're... you know, it's just it's not, yeah. it's not my taste. I'll be honest, it's not it's not really my cup of tea. This at all. Um, well, it's just. It's just not anything. It's not funny and it's not exciting and it's not scary and it's you know it's just mm. and it's a little you know it's and it's a bit creepy in places. I mean that 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 yeah, that yeah. Charles dance you know getting it on oh, with God, Debbie yeah. Mazar you know with his trying to get his artificial manhood working <laughs> was kind of I <laughs> yeah. don't know I was watching it thinking his what the robot hell? wang what the hell are they doing? <laughs> so, <laughs> oh dear. Yes. Yeah. Well, anyway, we're we're gonna end it there. Um, okay. Any any New Year's resolutions, Simon? 
uh well we'll just keep going on with the the podcast um we we've got a few things lined up uh nothing guaranteed but watch this space and uh you know we'll we'll be back with uh the next director uh and so we'll be back to let p uh we've got a special just to sort of carry us into the new year but uh we'll be back um second week of uh of january you know back to looking at carrying on with the a to z the directors and we're hoping to have some more you know guests on the show yeah that'll be excellent and we're pushing forward with our with our projects into 2016 oh we are indeed yes yeah. yes i mean hopefully uh i'll finish my feature film this year yeah i've got i've got a short in post production now that we uh, that we shot last year, and uh, that's that's currently in post. And uh, hopefully you'll have a, a feature in the works. Yeah, I'm I'm writing. Um, so yeah, there's, there's 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 all sorts of things happening. So uh, you, you know, um, as I said, 2015 was 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 a you know quite a good year. Um, and you know, obviously, you want 2016 to be even better. So yes, <laughs> we do. We wish all of our listeners a happy one. Yes. Happy New Year. And we uh, we hope it's a good one for you. We wish you all the best for the New Year. So let us sign off in our usual manner. Keith, where can we find your work? Okay. Uh, if you go to YouTube and put in British Isles, E-Y-L-E-S, uh, there's some of my work there. Oh, so you can find my work at independentrunnings.com. You can listen to this show on Stitcher, Mixcloud, YouTube, and iTunes. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Just search Movie Heaven, Movie Hell. And uh, please um, leave us a review and a rating on iTunes or Stitcher because um, every review and every rating we'll get will help spread the word of this podcast. Absolutely. So um, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for supporting the podcast for this its first year. You know, we're we're coming up to nearly doing this for a whole year now, and um, we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for for you guys out there listening. So, thank you so much, and uh, please uh, continue listening, spreading the word, and uh, we'll we'll bring you more entertainment from the film industry. Yeah, any feedback is very welcome. So, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yes, i uh, just been reminded by uh, Keith, we uh, didn't mention how our winners could uh, claim their prizes. Um, well, if if you don't get in touch with us, we'll get in touch with you guys. And we just need you to send us your address, um, you know, DM us either through Twitter or Facebook. And uh, we'll get your uh, prize sent to you in the post. Yeah, whether whether it will be a pleasant prize or a, <laughs> or not remains to be seen, right? <laughs> well, that is the uh, the joy of playing. Do you think, do you think someone will get space truckers? <laughs> <laughs> I think somebody will. <laughs> well, it's worth fifteen quid anyway. Exactly, it's probably the most expensive one. That's what's that's what's annoying. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Okay.